Good evening. Good evening and welcome. My name is Keith Cole and I serve as the executive director for the Wolf River Conservancy. And I welcome you all here for our, our lecture tonight. Our lecture, Gardening with Native Plants of the Mid-South, is a continuation of our lecture series, which is part of our educational outreach for the community. And I wanna thank our presenting sponsors for which uh, provide the support for us to provide such quality programming. First, I wanna acknowledge Buckman, which is our corporate sponsor, and our foundation sponsor is the Crawford Howard Family Foundation. We also wanna acknowledge all of our corporate benefactors, beginning with AutoZone, Bank of America, Brother International, FedEx, Hyde Family Foundation, the Griffles Foundation, International Paper, and Ring Containers Technologies for all their continued support throughout the year that supports us in so many different ways as we support our mission. And of course, our mission has remained the same for all these many years, protecting and enhancing the Wolf River and its watershed as a sustainable natural resource. And of course, we appreciate all of our volunteers and supporters, corporations, community organizations, individuals, and other groups that help us deliver on our mission. If you would like to support the Wolf River Conservancy financially, uh, tonight during this presentation, there will be a link in the chat box that will allow you to do that. And of course, you can always visit wolfriver.org to make a donation and it will always be appreciated regardless of what size of gift that would be. In addition, look for information soon on our Greenway Soiree. It'll look a little different this year. It will not be a physical event and we're working through those details, but you'll get information on how you can be part of our Greenway event this year uh, in November. So look for that information. Uh, I would like to remind you some housekeeping details. We ask that you not record tonight's program on any device. If you have questions, use the Q&A feature as opposed to the chat box. Uh, our Director of Education, Kathy Justice, will be collecting those questions and she'll ask those at the end of tonight's program. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you our presenter for tonight, Ann Ballantyne. Ann is certainly qualified to be speaking on tonight's topic. She serves as the Plant Activities Coordinator at the Lichterman Nature Center. Ann is the only horticultural employee at Lichterman, relying on a workforce of amazing volunteers that help her do all the good things at Lichterman throughout the year, such as managing and coordinating this annual spring plant sale, as well as the collection of seeds from the grounds for both propagation and the annual seed swap on National Seed Swap Day. And also maintains the demonstration gardens on the property at Lichterman Nature Center, which of course is located here in Memphis, Tennessee. It is my pleasure to present to you our speaker for tonight, Anne. Anne, welcome. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of our amazing plants we have uh, here in the Memphis area. And I'm also going to talk about some that um, I wish we didn't have. <laughs> but um, anyway, native plants are just a fantastic way to go in your garden. And I'm going to start screen sharing now. There we go. And I am going to go ahead and turn off my video because I don't want it to obscure any of the text or the photographs. So, all right. Um, I don't want to discourage anyone from using native plants. So this is more do than don't, but there are some things that you really want to avoid. And I've learned that from my years of working at the Lichterman. I've been the plant activities coordinator for about five and a half years now, but I first started as a volunteer back in 2011. So a little bit about the Nature Center. We are a certified Nature Center. We are a member of what was formerly known as the Pink Palace Family of Museums, and it has been rebranded as the Museum of Science and History. So if you see that around town, that is what used to be the Pink Palace. And we also have a new website. So it's moshmemphis.com. We are a living museum on 66 acres. We have 
lake, forest, and meadow habitats. And these are all within the city limits of Memphis. We have great educational programs for all ages. We serve tons of school children in the Memphis area and beyond. Um, we also have educational programs for adults. Our Backyard Wildlife Center houses lots of amazing native animals and it's curated by Mary Schmidt, who is an excellent ornithologist. If you are interested in birding at all, please visit our website and look for her birding events. We also have event spaces, both indoors and out. We have a great pavilion with a fireplace and a catering kitchen, which has been just fantastic for this past year and a half or so. And we have a horticultural operation, and I'll tell more about that in a minute. And then we recently became an Arbnet Arboretum. And we are a level two Arboretum, and we're really excited about that. So that's um, connected to the Wharton Arboretum. And you can find all of the Arboretums online. This is a map of the Arboretum trees and their locations. And so on the back of the map is our list of trees. And we were really excited this year, we found a butternut. Um, so that is a new tree for our Arboretum. And as was mentioned before, we could not do what we do there at the Lichterman without our volunteers. They are the workforce that makes all of our horticultural activities possible. They free me up so that I can actually do the work on the grounds, tenting the beds and stuff. Um, all of them are very knowledgeable, great people. So the American Chestnut Society recently gave us two chestnut trees and we have plans to plant those this fall. They'll only live about 25 years, but in the meantime, we can propagate from those plants. And we have various demonstration beds, each is designed to serve a particular purpose, sort of an inspiration for something you could do in your own yard. And our seed swap is most likely going to be an outdoor event this year. And we'll take advantage of the pavilion and the fireplace. And uh, Mary also leads a fantastic bird walk in the morning on that day. And then of course, our annual plant sale which has been online for the past two. We did more of a hybrid in 2021, um, but fingers crossed we'll move back to an on-site two-day plant sale like we've always done. And one of the special things about our plant sale is that these are truly local plants. The germplasm that we use to propagate these plants mostly comes from plants we keep on the grounds or plants that grow on the grounds. So I'm going to start out with trees and shrubs. This is uh, one of our planting areas and the foreground is Itea virginiana, which is Virginia sweet spire and in the background is Calacanthus floridus, which is Carolina allspice and both of those are fantastic plants for the garden. This is creating sort of a screen. We've used them to um, obscure some electrical equipment. So this first plant, also known as Frangula Caroliniana. So if you see Frangula Caroliniana, it is the same. Carolina buckthorn. It doesn't have thorns. It's only named buckthorn because it is in that buckthorn family. This is a great versatile plant. Sun or shade, this plant is in full sun all day long. And as you can see, it has a very full growth habit. Put it in a more shady location and you'll have a more open sort of tiered growth habit. It's also very tolerant of a wide variety of soil conditions. It prefers a moist location. Now this plant is at the very top of the slope, basically. And usually midsummer, I have to water it at least once. 
sustenance. Now the plant does not suffer from drought or anything, but it's a problem. We've got to keep it looking good. Now the flowers are really nothing for us to look at. They're sort of a, they're very small, white, greenish, but when you notice it blooming, you'll also notice that it is just covered in native bees and wasps, which are also important pollinators. And here- Oh, Ann, excuse me, your sound is going in and out. Oh, okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, so this picture is in mid-August, loaded with berries but they're not ripe. The red berries on this plant are not ripe. They will actually turn a blackish purplish when they're ripe. Um, birds adore them. And then as the berries all turn black, right now on this plant, about half of them are black, half of them are red. So that's a really cool look. Um, but when they all turn black, the foliage will also be yellow. I don't can't think offhand of another plant with blackberries and yellow foliage. Please tell me if anyone knows of one that's native. <clears throat> so it is deciduous. And if you keep it well pruned, you can have a very nicely shaped plant for the winter. It's very tolerant of pruning. Um, I usually prune it in the early spring before it's leaked out all the way and you can see the interior of the plant, eliminate crossing branches, eliminate dead wood, and that's your general rule for pruning any plant. Some of them are more particular about when you prune them, but you always want to eliminate crossing branches and dead wood. Um, and you can also prune it to keep it symmetrical. And I even prune this plant sometimes in midsummer because it's next to a walkway and we have to keep it clear for pedestrians. It is, however, difficult to propagate. And that's probably one reason why it's not highly commercially available. Um, I have collected seeds, treated them, and propagated them in the greenhouse, but the germination level is very low. And it seems to be the same way in nature. I was very excited to find eight seedlings last week underneath this plant. So this is not a plant that is going to become a problem in your garden. They're not gonna be popping up everywhere like little weeds. This one, however, can become a problem. You will find that you'll get a lot of seedlings, especially in disturbed areas. And this is one of the more popular native trees, more well-known native trees. Um, you really do have to prune this every spring. You can either cut it back to about a foot high and you'll end up with a, sort of a large shrub or you can leave it as a small tree but you have to go in every spring and get out all of the dead wood and all of the various crossing branches. It's a uh, has a pretty wild habit of growth. But as you can see, the berries are absolutely spectacular and uh, birds do really gobble these up. And the flowers are a good nectar source for some of the really tiny native bees that we have. It, as I mentioned, can go to seed and become a little problematic, especially in disturbed areas. And you wanna eliminate those seedlings. Um, they get very difficult to remove as they become um, trees. We recently tried to eliminate some at work because they had become too shaded out and it was quite the job. <clears throat> so, and this plant, as you would expect from the number of seedlings you get, it's very easily propagated from seed. American strawberry bush. It's a really interesting plant and it's much better used in a partially sunny location than a shady location. In the forest, um, there's a, and it's 
very shady. They tend to bend over. Well, first, they're very spindly, and they tend to bend over and root where they touch the ground, and they also form a lot of suckers. And excuse me, your sound is, we're losing you. We're losing your sound. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Thanks for telling me. So in the sun, it will have a completely different habit of growth than the spindly little things that you see in the forest. And it does not tolerate limestone. So if you have a limestone area, don't try this plant there. I had, um, unfortunately, it's not at this house where I currently live. And that's why this, this is a photograph of some plants that we will have for sale next year down in our shade propagation area. Um, <clears throat> I had this plant planted so that it would receive full morning sun until about 11 a.m. And I kept, uh, it won't suffer that badly in the sun. And I kept the lower limbs sort of pruned so that it would have more of an upright habit. And uh, it just turned into a fantastic plant, about eight feet tall. And the sunnier location also produces more flowers and then you get more of the fruit, which is really the show on this plant. I wish it were in fruit, but it has uh, seed capsules with berries inside. The capsules themselves are sort of a pinkish red and then the berries are a very bright red and they'll be ripening up in the next month or so and then the foliage will also turn red so you will end up with a great fall specimen plant if you plant it in a sunnier location as opposed to the spindly little things that you see in the woods now this is one of my absolute favorite small trees that's native to this area it will grow submerged and in those submerged areas, it will form a grove, um, but it will also grow just fine in a drier location. It is an extremely tough plant. This photo here is just before it really got into full bloom, but as you can see, the, the little balls all over the trees, those are gonna be um, balls of hundreds of tiny white flowers and the plant will just be covered in pollinators while it's in full bloom. Uh, spectacular swallowtails. I think it's one of the first things that the swallowtails actually notice um, because it's one of the first things I see swallowtails on that and fox. And then it's a larval host for two really cool moths. Um, the Titan Sphinx and the Hydrangea Sphinx. The Titan Sphinx is one of those enormous, really interesting looking moths. Um, it produces a prolific amount of seeds. Each one of these flowers turns into a seed ball and uh, they eventually all get dropped and they are eaten by birds. The great thing about growing this plant in a drier location is you do not get many seedlings at all. I might find one or two here and there, but it won't become a maintenance problem where you're, you're dealing with a hundred little seedlings underneath your plant. And as you can see, you can plant underneath it. So you can have shade plants close to it and you can have sunnier plants out further away from it. This uh, tree I'm pretty proud of. It was pretty badly neglected. And I've been working on it for the past three or four years to get it into better shape. Um, and it's looking pretty good, except for that top left-hand corner where you can see there's some dead wood that um, I'm five feet tall. I can't reach it. <laughs> so I need to get somebody tall to come out there and point it out to them. This... This plant is always in high demand at the plant sale and I've never seemed to have quite enough. Um, it's the larval host for the spice bush swallowtail and the caterpillar is just one of the coolest looking caterpillars there are. They fold up the leaf so you're not likely to see them um, very often 
but you might catch one as it's ready to go form its chrysalis or when they're very small or when they're moving from leaf to leaf. And then these berries, these bright red, beautiful berries are very fleshy and birds absolutely love them. And then the foliage on a nice warm day when you brush by the foliage, um, that just smells fantastic. Something to note if you want fruit, these plants are dioecious. That means you've got a male plant with male flowers and a female plant with female flowers. So you have to have a male and a female to get berries. And three plants, you should have both male and female. It can produce a lot of seedlings. So if you want a grove, you can let them go. But if you want to thin them out, you want to get them early in their growth, they put down a, quite a taproot. Um, and if you want to transplant them, you need to get all of that taproot or it won't, the plant won't survive. And it is like the buckthorn, sun and shade tolerant. I forgot to mention the beautyberry really only thrives in sun. But when it starts getting shaded, um, all those problems with dead wood become even worse. So uh, more sun like the buckthorn will produce a denser plant and you can even a well pruned plant, you can even turn it into sort of a specimen plant. And now we'll do one of the poll questions, please. Which of the following plants are the larval host for the monarch caterpillar? Common swamp or purple milkweed. And you will need to hit close on the poll when you are finished filling that out. I'll give everyone a second. Very good, knowledgeable crowd. Okay, we're gonna move on to herbaceous perennials. This photograph is of Hibiscus coccineus, which is the first one I'm gonna talk about. This photograph was taken, I believe it was last summer. This is not this summer. And I want you to notice the difference. This is the same plant, a little different angle but it's suffered because of our cold winter. It's fine, obviously it's alive, <clears throat> but uh, it is not nearly as vigorous as it normally would be. However, you really should have this in your yard. The hummingbirds absolutely adore this plant. And then it's this enormous plant with this really cool tropical flower. It can, I've, I have seen them grow up to 10 feet tall. And sometimes you may need to stake a piece of it or so if it falls over or you can just cut that piece off. Um, it does not like to sit in water. It, is, it does need moisture, especially to establish. However, it will not thrive in a soggy situation. And you can plant it with butterfly milkweed, Asclepias tuberosa. Plant the butterfly milkweed just they're at the perimeter of its roots and the hibiscus uses so much water that the butterfly milkweed will sort of be in a dry situation, which it prefers. And as I mentioned, it does not like the cold. Um, it will not survive in a pot during zero degrees. I learned that absolutely positively last winter. <laughs> and, uh, we lost a couple of them in the ground last winter also. I mentioned the hummingbirds. It's also attractive to other pollinators, especially butterflies. And then this is a really cool trick. Uh, you will want to cut down some of last year's stalks because they're brown and a little unattractive. But if you leave a couple, the hummingbirds will prefer preferentially perch on the old dead stalks as opposed to the new plant, new growth of the plant. And they will sit there 
and do a little bit of grooming and it gives you an opportunity to observe them. And then it will go to seed. Um, not so much this year, I learned also, zero degrees um, does, does not uh, encourage seedlings. I, I think it's just too cold for this plant. Um, but if you do get seedlings, they're very easily removed as soon as you see them. They will not have this palmate leaf. Uh, they'll have a different looking leaf when they're young. It'll be sort of oval with a very acute point. Um, so that's something to note. And another hibiscus. Now this one does require more moisture, but that doesn't mean it will also dry or grow in a drier condition. Um, at the Lichterman, we have some really nice plants that grow right there at the shore of the lake. And that's where I collect our seeds for propagating this plant. And as you can see, the flower is just beautiful. It will take up a lot of room in the garden. I've got one at home that I generally have to, I have to eliminate about a third of its growth or so because it just gets, it spreads a little bit too much for where it's planted. So that's something good to know. It is going to be a large plant. And as opposed to the hibiscus coccineus, it has excellent cold tolerance. I didn't lose a single one of these during the freeze last year in pots out exposed to all that weather. And this is really interesting, uh, supports a specialist bee, the hibiscus bee. And we had a researcher come by from the Missouri Botanic Garden um, and she was visiting various sites around Memphis to see how many hibiscus bees were in our urban area. Um, and she showed me their nests and exactly what their nests look like. They're sort of little caldera looking structures in bare patches of earth. This also I learned from the cold this year. Um, the one I have at home produced probably 50 seedlings, probably more. And I've never seen that happen before. So my assumption is that the cold, the cold stratification that it underwent increased the germination rate. So even though it was very unpleasant, we can, we can learn things. So those of you who have hibiscus in your yard, you may wonder what is eating the leaves of my hibiscus. It is this little fly's larva. This is the hibiscus saw fly. I think it's adorable. You'll see them all over the plant, but they, they will stop. Eventually the plant will put out new leaves. The leaves will, they'll eat them to the point where the leaves are nothing but the veins and it has this lacy appearance, but the plants will be fine. They'll put out new leaves and they'll bloom normally. <clears throat> this is perhaps one of my least favorite native plants. It's attractive, the flowers are very attractive and it's very attractive to pollinators. However, it is a nuisance and it is really not appropriate for your average home garden. If you have acreage that you want to restore, the woodland edge and you wanna plant a native pollinator plant there, it's a great option for that, but not for the home garden. Um, <laughs> very tall and really, really difficult to eliminate if you have a big established plant. The smaller also pretty difficult to dig up. They're not uh, a breeze or anything like that. Uh, we had to use some pick mattocks to remove some unwanted ones to redo a bed. It was just a nightmare. And then the seedlings. Hundreds and hundreds of seedlings. 
fortunately, the seeds are not wind blown. So if you do have it, you're not likely to find it, you know, hundreds of yards away, but in the general vicinity where the plants are. But there's so many of them, it's basically impossible to pull them all up. And you really need a tool. You can't just pop them out like easy little weeds. You really need a little weeding tool to make sure you get the entire plant out. When they get to a certain size, when you go to pull them, the top just breaks off and the taproot is left there. And then you end up with regrowth that's branched. So, still, is that better? Yes, but it's okay. It's just in and out. You'll have issues. I don't know if that is my Wi Fi. Let's scroll back down. Better? Yes. Okay. Okay, so do not plant this in your average home garden. It will be a nightmare and you'll really regret it. So apparently these plants used to grow in Tennessee. I haven't found anything that says for sure that they still grow in Tennessee, but there was a species, uh, the green pitcher plant that is known to have occurred on the Cumberland Plateau. These are just fun plants to grow though, if you enjoy unusual plants. They are also relatively easy to grow as opposed to something like a Venus flytrap. Um, Venus flytraps are just extraordinarily picky. And this photograph was actually taken at Carolina Beach State Park so that is in the uh, very southeastern corner of North Carolina, right there on the coast. And Venus flytraps do grow naturally here. This is within that very small range where they grow. But they also have these beautiful yellow pitcher plants. If you're ever in that area, it's totally worth a visit to Carolina Beach State Park. I saw a giant swallowtail while I was there. I saw a Venus flytrap, and then I saw a giant swallowtail fly by. As I said, they're easy to grow, but they will let you know if you have done something wrong, they'll start, they'll start to brown and look like they're going to die. A lot of times people have made the mistake of giving them fertilizer. You never ever need to fertilize this plant. Um, you grow it in a mix of peat and sand. You never use regular garden soil and you can create a bog in your garden if you would like to do it that way or you can create a bog container. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second, the results of that in a second. So they do require a dormant winter period for them to flower. And the spring flowers are really cool looking and they last for a very long time. Um, in this picture, there are flowers standing. There is on the sort of left-hand side of the photograph, very tall picture and down about halfway down, those are the flowers. And this picture was taken in late July. So they've been standing since mid-spring. And you can find, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. You can find some really cool hybrids. They do hybridize naturally in the wild, but you cannot collect wild plants. But there are plenty of online propagators of pitcher plants and the purple ones, these really cool looking ones, that is a hybrid between the parrot pitcher plant and the red pitcher plant. And the smaller plants here are red pitcher plants. You can propagate them by division very easily. They have a little rosette and it'll be really quite clear where to divide them and they have a little rhizome. Um, you can do them by seed, but in the wild, they actually propagate by their rhizome more than they do in the, with the seed. Um, I've started them by seed and about three years later, the plants were still only about three inches tall. 
So that's a very slow process. And we have some great people who donate plants to us. So this hybrid was donated by one of our regular plant sale customers because she had an excess. And the uh, this is pretty cool, this little red pitcher plant I bought as a dormant rhizome in one of those uh, fun carnivorous plant kits that you can find at Lowe's and places like that. Um, one little rhizome and I've got plants for as long as I need them. So we'll do the next question. So which of the following irises are native to Tennessee? Siberian, bearded, or dwarf crested? I hope y'all do as well as you did on the last one. I have a feeling you will. The correct answer is dwarf crested iris. So pretty good. The bearded iris is actually a hybrid. So that was a little bit of a trick question. This is a wonderful plant. Uh, I had a hard time identifying it for a few years because it's not in any of the ID books that I have. And then finally, um, a very knowledgeable native plant enthusiast was talking about this plant. And I said, wait a minute, that sounds exactly like the plant that I cannot get an ID on. So mystery solved. Mostly this plant is found in Florida and some along the Gulf Coast. It only naturally occurs in a few counties in Tennessee, including Shelby County. Otherwise, there are, I think, three or four counties along the Tennessee River. Um, you can see its little white bloom there. And this plant is still blooming. This picture was taken probably three weeks ago. These are still blooming. They'll almost bloom all the way up until frost. It does like a fair amount of moisture, but that doesn't mean it won't grow in a dry location also. You'll get a few excuse me you'll get a few less seedlings in a drier location so it's a little easier to control in a drier location not that it's really difficult to control in a wet location e either uh, even the mature plants actually pull up pretty easily and the seedlings are are just nothing to pull up on a relative basis so you can see the little green spiky balls. Those are the seed heads. And the seed will actually stop dropping or start dropping um, before the seed head turns all the way brown. So if you wanna control them, if you wanna control the number of seedlings, um, go ahead and cut off the seed heads while they're still green. And you can just cut this back if it becomes too leggy. It will uh, respond by sending up some new growth from the bottom. And it does have a tendency to become leggy, but it's also open and airy and you can plant it in with other perennials like phlox. Phlox and this plant do really well together. Garden phlox, the tall garden phlox. And its stems also have a really interesting mottled sort of purplish red pattern on them. And then 
the pollinators go nuts over it. It's one of those one of those plants when you walk by it, you say, what is that? It's just covered in pollinators. So it's definitely worthwhile if you have a place for it in your garden. And as I said, it will say self-seed, but this is not an overly aggressive plant like the um, frostweed. And this is a little bit of a cheat because it is not technically native to Tennessee. Uh, there's a couple of counties in Mississippi as far north as um, middle up Mississippi, the state Mississippi, um, where these do occur natively, but it thrives in our area. And it is an absolute hummingbird magnet. And this is still blooming prolifically. This picture was probably taken, oh, three weeks ago or so, and it is still setting new flower buds. It's almost nonstop until frost. So it'll get around five feet tall. That's about as tall as I've seen them in this area. And it's native habitat further south, Texas, um, especially is where you find this. It'll get much larger, but it still has excellent cold tolerance. There is a plant up at work that was uh, planted sort of by the edge of, for of the forest and every year or so I'll clear out around it and every year it's still alive although it's being completely shaded out and almost out competed it's actually blooming right now and I've never seen any of them really suffer from cold not even in pots they they live through the winter they lived through last winter so that's something um, you definitely want to decide on where you want this plant before you plant it. I've had to dig them up before and it was about a um, two or three hour process. It's very difficult. Not many seeds germinate. And when they do, the little baby plants are tiny and, and just pathetic and it's quite easy to get them out. Um, now, if you don't notice it, you can end up with um, an unwanted plant. So keep your eye out for seedlings if you want to control them. Now, I did find one this year in my yard and um, I decided where I wanted it and I moved it there. I've only watered it a few times intentionally and um, it's doing great. So very easy to establish, very easy to care for. <clears throat> so this genus has a number of species and they will hybridize so do your research to find out which types you want if if you don't care that they hybridize plant several species in my case i do care if they hybridize because i have a pure species to offer a plant sale and I am doing Vernonia gigantea because it's just. Is that better? Sound? Okay. So I'm only doing the gigantea because I don't want other species to mix in. I want to be able to grow pure gigantea for our plant sale. And this particular plant is about eight feet tall, I believe. I've seen it get even taller. I've seen it get up to 10 feet tall. And obviously the flowers are striking, very striking. It will, uh, one or two pieces of it may end up bending over, especially after a really heavy rain, but you just prop it up and stake it if necessary. And then it's another one of those plants that is just absolutely covered in pollinators um, and everybody wants to know what it is when they notice all the pollinators on it. Should be in every native garden definitely towards the back of a border. It's a wonderful plant. It's still blooming and there are other plants of this species on the ground that are not even in full bloom yet. And you will get some volunteers, but unlike frostweed, you don't get that many. 
and it's very easy to pull them out, up. It's also really easy to transplant them. If you would like to move them to a free plants, if you would like to move them to a more appropriate location. And this is a great companion plant for ironweed. It's one of our big native sunflowers. Um, full disclosure, this photograph is of a hybrid sunflower, but the flowers are practically exactly like this on Maximilian sunflower. Um, Maximilian sunflower is also very tall and very sturdy. So you can plant ironweed and Maximilian sunflower together and sort of use them to support each other and keep them from flopping over. Interestingly, usually they're blooming at the same time, ironweed and Maximilian sunflower. However, they're not this year. The Maximilian sunflower is quite late it's just now starting to really show its flower buds. So my assumption is that the cold winter um, just delayed the flowering some. It is a colony forming sunflower, so you won't really get plants from seed. Um, and if you wanna control, you'll get a big giant patch if you don't control it, but it's pretty easily controlled. If you get in there in the spring, early summer, when the soil is still workable, and when you see the new shoots, just find the rhizome that the new shoots coming off of, pull that up. You can discard it or you can plant it somewhere else. And it is a wonderful pollinator. Uh, this year it's going to provide nectar well into the fall. And you will see that uh, the pollinators are still out as long as it's warm enough and as long as there are flowers. Uh, one drawback is that mealybugs can be a significant problem. It doesn't hurt the plant, but it's definitely unattractive. What tends to happen is a few of the stalks will be completely covered in mealybugs. So you remove those, uh, dispose of them in the trash. You don't throw them in your compost pile. You know, dispose of them in a trash bag in the trash. And uh, the rest of the, they don't, seem to generally reappear. There might be a few here or there, but once you take care of the main population, uh, it seems to be okay. This, is uh, this particular one right here is canadensis, and it makes me sigh. Um, it is just extremely aggressive, spreads by rhizomes. If you have ever had to control it, you understand the rhizome problem. Uh, these, these rhizomes just go everywhere. And if you're lucky and you have really workable soil, if you get a rhizome, you might get two or three of the plants attached with the rhizome at the same time. So that's always exciting. Now, I don't want to say don't plant goldenrods because you absolutely should. Hundreds of species, most of which are native to North America. I think there's a few native to Europe, but this is really a North American genus. So um, look for ones that would be appropriate for different locations in your garden, but not Canadensis, not Gigantea. Um, those I know for sure you do not want in your home garden. Again, if you have acreage, and you want to restore with native plants, that would be a good choice. Next year at the plant sale, I know for sure we're gonna have, uh, it's Rugosa, the cultivar is fireworks, and we're gonna have short ah ah, and that cultivar is solar cascade. We'll also have cassia, which is blue wreath goldenrod, Omnifolia, elm leaf goldenrod, flexicollis, zigzag goldenrod, and also speciosa, which is showy goldenrod. And interestingly, this plant has been conflated with ragweed. Uh, ragweed does cause allergies. Goldenrod does not. The pollen of goldenrod is not windblown. It requires pollinators to move the pollen from plant to plant. So you absolutely cannot blame any allergies on goldenrod. Also, and interestingly, there was a time 
where this was being considered as the uh, national flower for the United States. And the, the uh, debate went on in Congress for quite some time and the goldenrod lost and roses won, which is a shame because it's a North American genus. So these two, Flexicollis and Omnifolia are both wonderful little woodland goldenrods. And this picture is Flexicollis. I believe I took it about a week ago. So it's blooming a little later than usual. Um, when it does bloom, it's just a bright yellow. It brightens up any, any woodland area. Same with the Omnifolia. You would want to locate them. They have different preferences. So the Omnifolia is more of a lowland plant. We have a really nice area where it slopes down to the lake shore and there's some really nice elm leaf goldenrod down through there. And this is at the top of a slope and it sort of slopes down to a bowl. Um, they will both sell seed, but they are not aggressive. This stand here, uh, I'd say three or four years ago, there were only about five or six plants. And as you can see, it has slowly spread into, I apologize for my dog. It has slowly spread into a little colony of about 15 plants or so. And that took several years. And I'm gonna finish up with the Tennessee State Wildflower. I'm sure, most of y'all are familiar with this, and if you've ever had it in your garden, you know that, um, that it can become quite a problem. It will spread by rhizomes underground and pop up everywhere. Um, it will also, if you have it in a perennial border, it will wrap around your plants and pull them down. And it's just generally kind of unattractive. Uh, but it's the larval host for the Gulf fritillary butterfly. And we all know those are absolutely beautiful and a really interesting caterpillar. So it's worth growing. It's also an herbaceous vine. So you never have the woody problem of some of the vines. I have at home, I did in a previous home, I had it uh, in my yard and it was in an area where I could actually mow around it. So that was a good way to control it. Um, I don't have a spot like that where I am now. So I have a giant planter and I just let it uh, crawl up on a terrace in the planter and I've got it on concrete so it can't root into the ground. And then of course, um, you want to collect the fruits to avoid any unwanted seeding, but those fruits are edible. Um, so if you've got children or grandchildren who you want to keep busy for a while, you can give them um, a passion flower fruit, they're called May Pops, and tell them to clean the pulp off of all the seeds and that will keep them busy for quite a while. And um, I'll take questions. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you, Anne, this is great. Um, Really interesting. We've got some questions. I'm just trying to get my video on. There we go. Okay. Okay. So um, first question here, I'm not sure, this is probably in reference to a plant. So the questioner might want to provide more detail. Um, it just says sun or shade. <laughs> so, um, you'll have to tell us what plant you're referring to. So I'm going to um, ask the next question, which is regarding Turk's cap. Um, he says not native to our microregion, but is it, but is not too far away and thrives here. Do you know why it is not native here, even though it thrives? That's an interesting question. And I've actually thought about that a little bit. Um, plants have enormous genomes um, and they can actually express they can change which genes they express depending on the environment where they're found. There was uh, some research done on goldenrods in Europe that in particular, I believe it was the Canadensis goldenrod. Um, and they discovered that, so they're invasive in Europe. Um, and they discovered that over the course of about 20 years, maybe even less, 
the expression of various genes had changed because it was in a different environment. Okay. That's right. my best guess. Okay. Um, here's another question. Is there a good vine to grow with passion flower so that it looks a little more full? And that, that oh. stumps her. I can't. You're stumped. I'm stumped. I mean, uh, well, the problem well, let me, is, yeah. I was gonna say the the problem is it just from my thinking about that, um, you may end up with more of a problem on your hand than a solution. because I just, vines can be so difficult to maintain and control in the first place. But um, I'm not saying don't try it. That's a really interesting question though, because yeah, they can be sort of sparse looking. Um, I, I'll throw in uh, that I have planted passion vine with native honeysuckle in a, in a few locations and um, they both seem to do okay. I could see, yeah, I could see that working pretty well. And a related question is how can I help my passion flower bloom? That's a good problem. They're, they're a good question. They're really kind of sparse bloomers. Um, you know, you could try using a bloom, burst, bloom boosting fertilizer at the recommended rate on the package because if you use that stuff wrong, um, it just doesn't work at all. So that would really be my only suggestion. Okay. Are there any smaller plants that do well in soggy areas? Ah, well, there are lobelias. So there, um, there's cardinal flower. Lobelia cardinalis and there's Lobelia syphilitica. They can get kind of tall, but it's a, you know, it's a flower spike from a basil rosette. And both of them are good in pretty moist areas. There are some really aggressive plants that will grow in moist areas. Um, there is uh, the lizard's tail. Yep, lizard's tail, um, but it, it can really take over but as far as height, it's not very tall. Okay, so cardinal flower is a good one. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, and if you go ahead. Oh, it's a quick note. If you plant cardinal, if you plant cardinal flower and great blue lobelia together, um, they can hybridize, and then you'll get seedlings, and there'll be all this. Uh, there'll be various colors of purple. It's kind of cool. Oh, neat. Okay, here's a tree question. What mid-sized native tree would you suggest for the sunny front of the house in the middle of the lawn? Did you say medium-sized? What mid-sized native mid -sized. tree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would go with a button bush or a Carolina buckthorn, depending on um, what kind of interest you want out of that plant for that area. Okay. Um, and I have a buckthorn question that was asked earlier. Um, uh, I think it's in reference to the buckthorn in your photo that you took. Was that in the sun or in part shade? Oh, it's in full sun. All day, full sun. Okay. Okay. Um, here's someone just thanking you for your very helpful information. You're and, welcome. And this question, do you recommend the yellow passion flower, which is more delicate, but also host the fritillary? Yes, um, I have some of that at my house and it, it's not uh, as problematic as the purple passion flower. It doesn't pull your plants down and stuff like that. It is absolutely more delicate, but more, way more difficult to um, propagate. And I've just now figured out how to get passion flower to um, germinate from seed. There's a lot of conflicting information on how to do it. And it seems that the trick is uh, 
very cold period. Okay. All right, here's another question. Would there happen to be any native uh, flowers or herbs that would do well as companion plants with vegetable gardens, similar to how people plant mint or marigold for pest control? We have native mints. You could try that. I don't know about pest control with native mints. Um, however, they are pollinator magnets, so you'll get the benefit of pollinators coming to your vegetable garden. Um, there are also some of the well-behaved goldenrods, not the crazy giant ones that go everywhere, but the uh, goldenrods also are hosts for beneficial insects. So you may get some pest insect, insect control by planting goldenrod in the vicinity. And again, also attracts poll pollinators. Okay. All right, and uh, do you, uh, what books do you recommend for people wanting to learn more about native plants? That's I use, yeah. that's a good question. Mostly, uh, mostly, so if I have a question about how to propagate something, for instance, I sort of cross-reference a few different websites. I use Lady Bird Johnson, mm -hmm. um, Missouri Botanic Garden, and IllinoisWildflowers.org. Occasionally, I'll use NC State. Um, they have a lot of good information also online. Um, so I'll, I'll just take sort of all the information for those different regions and figure if I average it, then we'll get something close to our region. That's for culture, propagation, um, all sorts of information you want to know about a particular plant. And then the main book that I actually use at work is the uh, Tennessee Wildflowers book, the guide to the, I can't remember the exact name of it now, but it has a picture of um, Golden St. John's Ward on the front and it covers Tennessee, all of Tennessee, and then parts of Kentucky and parts of the areas south of us. And it's a wonderful guidebook. And in all of those descriptions, it references similar species. So it's a great learning tool. Oh, great. Okay, and finally, this is our last question. Is there a fall plant sale? At, or what are, the, what are the plant sales going on at Litterman? We do not have a fall plant sale. We will have our uh, usual spring plant sale. I believe the exact dates are going to be April 14th and 15th next year. And then at our seed swap, um, we, we have loads. I never, give, I never actually give away all of the seeds that I've collected from the grounds. So that's how many we have. So uh, you can just come in to the seed swap and get as many free seeds as you would like. Oh, and I should mention any any organization who's listening, anybody who's a member of um, any sort of a horticultural, ecological, conservation sort of uh, related group, we'd like to invite you to be a community partner at our seed swap this year. Great, I'll bring something. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I know that uh, this will, this is actually the last question. <laughs> I know a lot of people struggle to find native plants. Um, besides the Lichterman spring plant sale, where else would you suggest they look for native plants? Melodia Hill Farms. I believe they're in Jackson, Tennessee. That's good to know. So, yeah, um, good source for plants that'll be okay in Memphis. And then uh, the Strawberry Plains Audubon Center. They also have a native plant sale. And they've got great people down there, good plants. Okay, well, thank you so much, Anne. This has been a great program. Uh, you're, you uh, are a wonderful expert in native plants. Thank you everybody for attending tonight. Um, our next lecture will be on owls uh, in um, October. I think it's October 20th and we hope to see you there. And uh, please visit our website for activities, wolfriver.org. Thanks very much. <laughs> Night, Thanks, everybody. everybody.
Bye, Ann. Bye. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. See you soon.